All right, so, hey, uh, this is kind of a crash course on using the NASA Exoplanet Archive to get into the Kepler database, which we were talking about a little bit today in class. And since we had a couple of people who were not uh, present, I figured I'd just do a quick uh, show and tell here. So I've given you some Kepler IDs. And if you go to their website, which I've put on Canvas, and see the three IDs that I've given you for some analysis for homework. I'm just going to choose one uh, that they gave to us for free here, uh, just so that we can look at some exemplified data. Enter the ID into the ID field and click the View button on the right, and it will uh, give us the fundamental information that you need to know. Uh, here we've got uh, the count, if you will, of the data set, the star ID. These should all be the same. Uh, the type of uh, target. Uh, these are long cadence uh, measurements from Kepler. That is a measurement every 30 minutes. Uh, which quarter of data was this data released, etc. If you're curious about these, these entries and what they mean, you can click on any of the column headers and it will bring you to a definitions page to help you out. Uh, going further to the right, they give you things like the effective surface temperature of the star. This one in case is about 5100 Kelvin. Uh, and the radius and solar radii. So it's a slightly larger star than our sun in terms of radii. If you click on any of these uh, PDCSAP time series, it, they all bring you to the same page. It opens up another tab in your browser. And it will show you a, a time series of effective flux versus time for all of the time series that they have for this particular star. And you'll see that there are an awful lot of them uh, here for this star. Uh, as we discussed in class, this flux is in electrons per second, uh, effectively a measurement right off the CCD camera. You'll also see that the values are kind of all over the place in terms of flux levels, uh, but they seem to be consistent throughout one data series, and that's because they're actually rotating and moving uh, this particular target star onto a different part of the chip. And then different sensitivity levels of the CCD chip will result in different flux levels. So what you're seeing is not really variability in the star at, at this level. But you can just draw a box around any of these and kind of zoom in a little bit on the data. And it allows you to get a feeling for what the star may or may not be doing. But we can also analyze it in terms of a periodogram. And we can select any, just, just pick one of the uh, of the data sets and tell the system to compute a periodogram. And as discussed again in class, this creates a, a plot of the relative power or significance of particular uh, frequencies of which this star may or may not be vibrating. It does take some time. This is using a fast Fourier analysis in the background. Uh, their computer systems are doing quite a bit of work here to provide us with uh, data analysis free of charge, which is kind of cool. So here we go. Uh, we've got an analysis. We have a primary uh, frequency, the, the highest uh, power level, just over 120 uh, for a period that is under a day. Down here, uh, one day is 10 to the zero. There's a, a secondary power level here, and then there's a lot of other stuff going on. Over here on the right, you'll see a table of peaks. That's a table of these peaks in the middle of your plot. The one with the highest rank, number one, is the one with the highest power, 123.5 uh, days, uh, the power, sorry, a period of 0.36 of a day. And you can tell the system to take all the data and to overlay it using the period of 0.362 of a day, and it will create a, uh, a flux versus time plot with that appropriate period and gives you the availability uh, to look at like what this thing is doing. And you can see it's almost sinusoidal. There may be some uh, dippy stuff going on in there, but this is a relatively good plot of the star. So it seems like this star has some kind of pulsation going on, maybe even a double pulsation. And, uh, and there you have it. So that's how you utilize this. Um, once again, when you're way back in, in the beginning, uh, looking at, uh, the overall data sets available to you, you can pick any data set that you wish to plot. So it's probably a good idea to pick a couple. Um, 
So we were plotting number seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven was this kind of, looks to me, brown, reddish brown color. You may want to try seven, eight, and nine just to see if it's consistent. Maybe the star is consistent, maybe not. But I'll let you play and I'll let you decide. And that is all. We'll talk more in class.